to pray in the Holy Spirit a lot. And when you pray the Holy Spirit, you pray with your whole heart. You don't just do it like for, um, you don't subject yourself to periods. Like all throughout your life, you'll have to pray in the Holy Spirit to get to the next level of the knowledge of the will of God. So there's something that he wants you to know, but he'll hide it in praying in the spirit so you yourself could put in the investment to retrieve that knowledge, to take a hold of that knowledge. When you pray in the Holy Spirit, there is a mental operation of God's mindset being given to you. In Romans chapter 8, verse 26, it said something amazing. It said that the Spirit helpeth our infirmities. Do you know that you can have an infirmity inside of your soul? What happens when you have an infirmity inside of your soul? What is an infirmity? It's a disadvantage. It's something that could blatantly, uh, tangibly be felt. You could feel it emotionally. It touches your senses and it brings you back. It don't, it don't take you forward per se. It brings you back. It brings you back to a place where you need assistance. It brings you back to a place where you need um, help. You need accommodation. You need hospitality from God. So when we're looking at the infirmity that the Holy Spirit helps you with, everybody has an infirmity, the possibility of an infirmity in their soul because your mind could get distracted in one minute. Your mind could start focusing on the wrong things. You could have a wrong conversation. You could have a wrong expectation. That's what worry and doubt is and fear is. It's a wrong expectation. It is you predicting your own demise. It's you predicting your own defeats. It's you anticipating your own sorrows. You see, when you become natural minded, it's very easy for you to lose hope. Because natural mindedness is where is the world of Satan showing you the outcomes of life. You, you see that natural mindedness is the world of Satan showing you the outcomes of life. So whenever somebody has a, a prayer in the spirit. Romans chapter eight, verse 26 said that the spirit help if your infirmities. That means that wherever you're at a disadvantage in your emotions, you know, this depression. Is dead emotions. Is dead thoughts. Depression, anxiety, these are deadly senses, deadly emotions, deadly imaginations. You know, the demonic thing about anxiety is that when you get there, you're not operating in the composure of God. You're not operating in the the persona, the personality of the father, you're operating in your own impatience, your own zeal to see something happen at your own timing. So there, there, is, a, there is a warning in the word that said, be anxious for nothing. Even the things that you're promised for. Even the things that you're anointed for. That means that even if you're praying for a man in a wheelchair and you're anointed to, to get people out of wheelchairs, don't be anxious for that. Don't be anxious for nothing. That means don't even be anxious for something that you've been promised, something that's been prophesied to you. Don't be anxious for nothing. Being anxious for nothing means being anxious for nothing. Don't be anxious for sex. Don't be anxious for marriage. Don't be anxious for children. Don't be anxious for nothing. Because let me tell you something about anxiety. It takes away your respect for God. Anxiety doesn't respect God. Anxiety respects 
personal desires. So everything that you'll do will go in the direction of personal desires. It won't go in the direction of God. Anxiety runs after a craving. It doesn't run after Christ. The Bible said be anxious for nothing. That means even though I told you I'm going to do this, don't overly anticipate it to the degree that you have a wrong attitude and a wrong spirit and wrong words and wrong mood swings. When you pray in the Holy Ghost, you take back dominion over your inward man. There are different languages in tongues for a reason. Because you're traveling into the depths of God's belly, his mindset, his ways. So if somebody prays in the spirit, we're all focused, and they are operating in new tongues, they know things about God that you don't know. And the things that you call sin, they may know that is not sin. If I didn't pray in the Holy Ghost, I would not have known that Abraham was not sinning against God when he said, this is my sister. But if I don't pray in the Holy Ghost, if I don't go to the depths of God's belly, I'll teach you, you know, Abraham, he was a man, but he had some sin in his life too. Look, he, he even lied, said that this was his sister. That wasn't a lie in God's sight. Simply because Abraham was operating in a place where God was throwing things at him and God was saying, let me see if you're going to stumble. You don't believe it? Let me show you. Let me show you visibly. It was demonic for you to pitch your child on an altar and offer them up to Satan, the gods. People was doing that. They were setting their children on fire and saying, I'm offering up my child to the gods. So Abraham knew that this was culturistic, it was witchcraft, it was sorcery. But God comes to him one day and says, offer up your son to me. Wow. That's a plot twist. That's a plot twist. I'm giving you a whole cinema. I'm giving you a whole climax right here. That's a plot twist because now God is saying, I'm going to throw something at you. That you with your own eyes done saw people do this in the natural and you had finalized, wow, they offering up their children, they doing sacrifices to gods and stuff. And now here comes the Lord God, the Lord, the most high God. And he tells you, okay, offer up your son to me. Psychologically, you have to go into a place of humility that you've never been because you got to downgrade your previous interpretation. You got to decimate. You got to remove all the stains of your former philosophy. You have to annihilate your traditions. Your opinions have to go down the drain in that one moment. And you have to say, okay, I come into alliance with new wine. I get rid of the old wine skins. And now I step into new wine. See, when you pray in the Holy Spirit, there are languages that are carrying a, a depth of strength for you to align yourself with the mindset that God is newly introducing to you. That's why you have to be very careful when you drink new wine and people have never had even wine at all. Because they haven't been intoxicated with the knowledge that you're intoxicated with. Nor do they have the capacity, the preparation, or the conditioning to receive that. You tell me somebody that has never worked out in the last six months and you've been working out every single day for the last six weeks 
and you bring them into your conditioning. They don't have the conditioning to last like you. Because you have prepared your lungs for endurance. Your body is prepared for intensity. Your blood cells, they are ready to move at Lamborghini pace. They're ready to move fastly. Your bones have been prepared for pressure. Your ligaments have been prepared for, for great solid working out. You pit them there, they're tired. You know why? Because no conditioning. That's the same way it is in the spirit world. When you pray in tongues, you have conditioning. You know how to handle God in ways that people say, no, this is Beelzebub. You know how to handle God in ways where people would say, no, this is evil. This is wrong. Apostle Paul, he was a master in praying in tongues. And he's able to rebuke Peter and tell Peter, what are you doing? Why are you treating the Gentiles differently when you get around other Jews? You're treating them like you don't know who they are. Who are these people? They're weird. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. God, God gave the gospel to us Jews. And Apostle Paul came to him and said, listen, you got a little thing about you where you proud. You, you want to hide and, and, and you want to uh, keep yourself married to prejudice. When you get around the Gentiles, you don't want to act like you got revelation of what the Lord said, that he's pouring out his spirit on the Gentiles. You want to act like, no, I don't know them. Yeah, they're a little weird, man. They, they, they think that this gospel for them, now nah, it's only for us. And, you know, yeah, yeah, they unclean. Remember, we're not supposed to talk to them. Yeah, I, yeah, I dig that. And he didn't want to take a stand. Remember, Peter had an issue. God shows up to him in a vision. And God shows him meat. And he says, no, no. God says, kill and eat it. And he's hungry. But he still said, no, 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 that's unclean. And the voice of the Lord said, never say what I say is clean. It's common. Never come and contradict me. Boy, you don't even know what clean is. You just came to the earth and people told you what it means to be clean. You don't know what wisdom is. You just came to the earth and people told you what education means, what it means to be smart. Boy, you don't even know what freedom is. You came to the earth and you have freedom interpreters. I'm just giving you a paraphrase. It's funny how you try to contradict God with man knowledge. As if you know what it means to be good and what it means to be moral and what it means to be pure and what it means to be right and what it means to be holy. And you just came to this earth. The one that was here before there was an earth, before there was a heaven, is the one that's dealing with you. So humble yourself. 